Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. Many times on our podcast, we talk about the differences between living and working in rural America in contrast to an urban setting. Today, our guest gives you her perspective on how similar it really is. Shannon McCarthy is a native of Southern California who has now lived in the Midwest for more than 20 years. As an associate professor of marketing and the department chair of the Department of Marketing, Public Relations, and Sports Management at the University of Central Missouri, Shannon shares her insight and experience on public relations, social media, influencer marketing, NIL name, image, and likeness, artificial intelligence, and more. Stay tuned for a great conversation encompassing many aspects of branding and marketing in today's world, regardless of where you might live. Welcome to OutDrive, Shannon. Great to be here. Well, I've been looking forward to meeting you and getting to know you and certainly want to hear your perspective as an educator about public relations, social media, and how to use them effectively. And I like to talk about marketing trends and what you think are kind of cool and certainly want to hear about what's happening at the university. But before we go down any of those roads, let's start by having you tell us just a little bit about yourself. All right. So I'm Dr. Shannon McCarthy. I am an associate professor of marketing at the University of Central Missouri. I am also the department chair for the Department of Marketing, Public Relations, and Sport Management. I've been here for about eight years now. I've been teaching since 2011, which is kind of wild to me, but it's really been pretty fun. I grew up on the West Coast, um, Southern California, and then decided to come out to the Midwest for college. Ended up at a couple different places, really liked it out here. I will say also my entire extended family is from the suburbs of Chicago, so I'm there quite a bit and have been basically, like I said, my whole life. And so we kind of settled down in this area and really enjoyed kind of the pace of life, being able to kind of balance having what we want to have with our family, as well as being able to still get to see family when we need to and when we want to, even if we are a little further away than maybe we would want to be necessarily. Well, what attracted you to the Midwest for college? So like I said, my whole family is from the Midwest. They're all from Chicago. And I had always wanted to go to a big state school. The California university system is a little bit weird in that you have kind of two parallel school tracks. So you have the University of California system. So that'd be like UCLA, Cal Berkeley, UC San Diego, anything like that, as well as the Cal State system. So something like Fresno State or San Diego State or anything like that would fall into those kind of two tracks. And, you know, when I was in high school and was looking at colleges, there was just a lot of randomness that I wanted in where people were going to school. And I wanted to go where I wanted to go and didn't want to have to feel like I was rolling the dice the same way. And so I knew that I wanted to be at a big state school. It felt like it would be kind of a good fit for me personally. I liked having seasons, even though I didn't really get to grow up with seasons all that much in Southern California. You pretty much get warm and then June gloom and then fire season. And then if we're lucky, we get smell Nino years. So dousing out the fire season, then you end up with mudslide season. And so, you know, it's just, it's lots of fun. But I liked the idea of, I don't want to say classical education, kind of that classical college experience that people think of. And so I was a swimmer in college, so I ended up starting at Mizzou. Didn't really get along all that well with my coach, and so I ended up transferring to Cincinnati. I also liked the idea of being a little bit closer to a slightly bigger city, but it was also a school that had a lot of the things I was interested in, had a lot of really great opportunities. At least the coach um, for me as an athlete, it was a very education-focused school. 
And so that really appealed to me. I mean, I had teammates who were biomedical engineers and architects and doing all these just kind of really, really intense things. And our team GPA average was typically somewhere around like a three, four. And so that really was something that was a good fit for me. I really wanted to be able to kind of balance the two, be able to still have college experiences and a student at the same time. And it really, for me, was a good fit. I liked being at a big school. I liked being in a big place. I went to a high school that my graduating class was like 650, somewhere in there. And I think we'd started out somewhere around 800, 850, just kind of people moving and things like that. And so I knew I liked to be somewhere that was a little bit bigger. So it's definitely a little bit different here at UCM in Warrensburg, but it's well suited for me. And I feel like I fit pretty well. I really enjoyed being in the Midwest. What was your sport? I was a swimmer. So don't ask me to play any sports on land. It's not pretty. If you really want to be entertained, like throw something at me, I will most likely be hit in the face, but you know, it's all fine. (laughs) Whereas, yeah, I'm like, if I'm in the pool, I'm great. Totally great. But I've now been retired for quite a while and and it's been, it's been enjoyable to have retirement. (laughs) Do you enjoy the Olympics? Oh yeah. Absolutely. I've had lots of friends who've been on on teams. I've got friends who've been, you know, who've coached. I've got lots of people I know. So it's always exciting for me to be able to at least see people I know or are somewhat adjacent. Swimming is a really weirdly small kind of ecosystem. And so way too many of us know way too many of us. And it can be very insular, but it's a lot of fun to be able to see people. A guy I went to high school with and swam with growing up, he went to the games in Sydney and then uh, his name is Anthony Irvin, and then he came back in 2016 and ended up winning again. So it was kind of fun to see him as I'm, you know, in high school, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, I'm you know, going into full time work and things like that, and kind of seeing that him bookend that, and and still be able to see him compete as well as he did into you know his mid to late 30s, which doesn't sound that old, but for a lot of swimmers for a long time that was kind of like, whoa, whoa, grandpa, what are you even thinking of doing? But it's been a lot of fun to, it's fun to watch, but it's also fun to not be the one that's in the pain in the pool. I don't miss some of that. <laughs> understand. It's neat to have those connections to be able to view it that way. So did you always think that you were going to become an educator? No, not in the least. I really thought I was going to go into broadcast journalism. My dad, he's a cameraman, news photographer. He's been my whole life. I liked that idea, but I also thought I wanted to do more on camera work. Although realistically, teaching is actually not that far removed from being a reporter. Honestly, it's it's a lot of the same skill sets, a lot of the same being able to talk to people, being able to kind of get information from folks and be able to have those kinds of discussions. It kind of was something that as I grew up, I did a lot of coaching and swim lessons and all that, and it kind of came naturally to me. So it was a pretty easy transition. Truthfully, I thought I was going to go into like athletic administration at the collegiate level is kind of what I was thinking. And then it turned out I didn't enjoy seeing how the sausage was made. And I liked being on the education side a little bit more. And so I kind of transitioned into there and it suits my skill set well, where I can have a lot of different experiences day to day. And for me, I really like that. Well, it sounds like you landed in a great position for your background and your degrees and your experience. And that kind of all makes sense. You know, when I was preparing for today and I saw these really cool internships like Jimmy Kimmel Live and Brand Ambassador for Newcastle, I thought, well, that makes sense. Tell us about those experiences and maybe your perspective on internships. I'm a huge proponent of internships. They were really fantastic experiences for me. Anytime you're going to actually get hands-on experience doing different jobs, you're going to learn something, whether it's good or bad. You might learn that, hey, this is absolutely what I love doing, or absolutely it's, oh, no, 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 this is really a terrible, terrible idea for me to go into this. I got really lucky in that everything that I interned with was a good fit for me. Having grown up in kind of news and entertainment in LA, I hate to say I was kind of used to seeing celebrities anyway, but I kind of was. And so this sounds really weird, but my sweet 16 was chaperoned by reporters from ABC, NBC, Fox, KTLA. And so I've kind of had like a, a bit of a weird childhood. And so I have a little bit of a sometimes 
kind of a quirky perspective. I'm like, celebrities are people just like us. They have to fill out the same tax paperwork. I know this because that was part of my job was filling out tax paperwork for them for when they're on the show. It's And yeah, having to be able to talk with them was a lot of fun, be able to help cast some different things. I was fortunate because I was there right before one of the writer's strikes. And so they knew that there were some writer's strikes coming. And so they were kind of trying to get a few extra things in the can during the summer I was there. And so I did get some pretty fun experiences with helping to, I wasn't, you know, being the creative, but trying to help get things cast and help kind of handle talents and do a lot of basically people management, which honestly is a lot of what I do anyway in my job now, whether it's going to be with faculty or with students, I'm still having to do a lot of that kind of, it's more, I guess you could say a little more along lines of shepherding than really anything else, but Even now, I'm still trying to get people to fill out paperwork and do things like that, whether they're students or faculty. And so that's been kind of interesting. Working with Newcastle was a lot of fun and doing some of that was a great fit, which is funny because back then, I really was not a big beer person. And now I've gotten much more into craft beer as I've gotten older. I'm like, oh, kind of funny. I'm like, now go back. I'm like, man, I would have, I really liked beer back then. That would have been a really great job. (laughs) (laughs) It was kind of a nice introduction, at least two more of that and being able to get a chance to talk to people. I can have kind of that one-on-one engagement while also still having the public kind of moving around and talking to lots of people, which was a lot of fun to get to do. Sounds like some great experiences, fun experiences. It's always funny to see which celebrities are great with people and which ones are maybe less great with people. And you can always tell who is a good human by how they treat interns. That's very insightful. That's very similar to, you know, going into a sales role, like with our organization and approaching people and how you treat the receptionist, the gatekeeper many times, very similar to that. And, you know, we're big on internships here. We've had so many great interns over the years. In fact, I'm getting ready to interview one of our past interns who is now in a healthcare marketing role for the University of Missouri. Just talked to her last week, kind of preparing for this. And I just love that to see, you know, an intern really develop not only while they're with you, but then where they go with their career. It's very gratifying as an employer to see that. So we're always looking for a good intern. So going forward, just send us your best students. Yeah, absolutely. It's always fun to see what they end up being able to do, especially the ones who maybe didn't have as much self-confidence, but then once they actually started doing the job, they realized, oh, I am good at this. I love it when that happens. When you see that light bulb click, there's nothing better. There really is nothing better. I agree. And you know, on the flip side of that, the ones that do the internship and discover that this is not what I thought it was going to be. This is not for me. I'm going to find my way another way. And that's fine too. It's a great opportunity to kind of test the waters both ways. Absolutely. So yeah, I can't tell you how many students I've had that are like, oh, I want to go into this field. And six months later, they're like, about that. That maybe wasn't the best idea for me. I was like, yeah, yeah. Let's see if we can figure out what did you dislike about that? Okay, let's use that as a starting point for then where we want to go going forward. It's been a lot of fun. I don't know what the percentages are. Maybe you do of the kids that change their major throughout. Is it 50-50? I mean, it's got to be pretty high. I would assume it's probably pretty high. I know for me, I changed quite a few times. My undergrad started out as a double major in broadcast journalism and economics. That's an interesting combination. I wanted to do business reporting. So it's actually really not that far off where I ended up, but ended up with my undergrad as a dual communication and public relations degree. So kind of an interesting transition. But yeah, you never know where you're going to end up. That's one of my favorite sayings. You never know. Let's talk a little bit about your perspective as an educator relative to PR and social media. What's your perspective on how that all relates to marketing? So I always tell my students, I'm like, if they don't know about your brand, they can't buy you. But if they don't like your brand, they're not going to take the time to get to know you. And so I almost see PR as kind of that, not necessarily warm and fuzzy, but really it is the warm and fuzzier side of marketing where it is, hey, You need to like us before we can even get to the point where we can talk about sales or anything like that. And so I think it's really important to be able to have brands that are 
actually genuinely trying to get to know their customers and genuinely trying to, you know, maybe humanize themselves. Some brands do a really great job of being very human and having their own real personality. Some do not. Um, I think Homefield Apparel does an amazing job of being who they are and really embracing it. And they've done a fantastic job of getting partnerships with things like different podcasts that are a really good fit with their brand. They're a vintage collegiate apparel brand that, full disclosure, I love their clothes. They are so comfortable, but their social media presence is fantastic. They know who they are. They really kind of tried to have their own little kind of niche that they've taken over. And I think they've done a, a wonderful job of being human, but still having fun. And I think that people see that and they can see that authenticity. And that really does make a huge difference in sales, especially with some of those smaller companies. And Homefield started out literally in their kitchen dining room, putting shirts together and packaging them out that way. And now they have warehouses. So it's kind of cool to see brands that are doing you know, what they want to do and what they feel is the right thing to do and how they have seen a lot of growth as well. I think those are great examples. And you know, one of the philosophies that we use in our business, which parallels exactly what you've just described is know, like, and trust. They have to know you, then they have to like you before they'll trust you to buy. Absolutely. It's like any kind of relationship. It's like, I'm not going to trust you as a relationship partner until like I actually know you and I take the time and I get to like you and all that. And so you're not going to just open up to any random person. But if you take that time, that's when you can really start to get that stronger foundation and really start to build that long-term relationship. Yeah, agreed. Well, how do you think social media has changed public relations? It's very much a double-edged sword. I think it's been really great to allow us to be able to get directly to constituents a little bit more effectively than, you know, having to work through an additional kind of, you know, that additional third-party middleman. When I was at Arkansas, they actually were one of the first schools that did, when they were announcing a new kind of athletics master plan, they didn't do it as a press release first. They did it as a basically what I would call almost like a social media job. That was where they did that. They went directly to people. It wasn't, hey, this has got to be filtered through press conference or press release, but this is going directly to who we want to talk to. These are going directly to our constituents. And so it was really kind of neat to see how that maybe shaped a little bit more of the messaging because you could really tailor it a little bit more towards those particular consumers and have the message actually go out the way you want to. Whereas, you know, it's like with a press conference, there's always going to be some kind of lens that it's viewed through, regardless of what the news organization might be and what their intent is, there's always going to be some perspective on it. And But if you're going directly to those constituents and those consumers, it's hard to kind of lose out on that framing on how you want to be framed. So I think that's been really positive. Now, on the flip side, then you can also have those experiences where, you know, the old phrase, there's no such thing as bad press. Well, with social media, unfortunately, I don't know if that's necessarily true anymore, just because of how quickly it allows for messaging to move. Now, if it's something positive that people really love, great. But if your company really screwed up, oh, no, this is bad. This is very, very bad. What were you thinking? And the internet is forever. So just kind of got to remember that. Yeah, I agree. And before social media, if there was bad publicity, the backlash was sort of more indirect. Whereas today, if it's bad publicity, you have this two-way communications where people can get on the bandwagon and just start building this anti-sentiment against a brand. And that can be very powerful, very hurtful. Oh, absolutely. And it becomes so easy for people to throw on lots of different commentary on just such a quick blurb that it's hard to stop that train once it gets going. Now, granted, we all have like the memory of the hummingbird. And so kind of gets to the point where you're like, okay, well, this will pass. But at the same time, you're like, hopefully, there's still some of those things that have definitely like stuck to a point. I still laugh about United Airlines and basically United Airlines Fight Club, where you had people who didn't want to get off the plane and those who were like, no, you are getting off the plane and, and things like that. It's, it may not be in the same public consciousness, but it's still there. And I think people still, still do have memories that, that work longer term than we maybe think about. 
And so we always want to watch out for that. So I think it's been great because it allows us, you know, to be able to get to people a little bit more directly, but also at the same time, we can get to people a little bit more directly, which maybe is not always the best way to be. So better make sure you've got it well thought out and planned before you do it. Yes, absolutely. So what do you think it is about the psychology of people that makes consumer media so interesting for them? Great question. I think that kind of having having that ability to talk to people without any boundaries, whether it's going to be temporal, so if you're thinking time or geography, being able to kind of have all that access is really interesting for people. Fortunately or unfortunately, that does speed up the movement of messages, which, you know, good or bad, but also that movement, we're all being inundated with messaging so much that that also is going to add into that shortened memory. It's like we have the 24-hour news cycle. Eh, is it really 24 hours anymore? It's To me, it's getting a lot shorter. Kind of, it's like there are days where I'm like, this is like a three-hour news cycle. Like if I'm watching football on a, on a sad college football, I'm like, this is a one-hour news cycle. I forgot that Florida State got demolished in their week zero game. And then, you know, by week one, kind of forgot about that. And, oh, no, they got demolished again in their week one game. Sorry, Florida State. Any Florida State fans who might be listening. But it, it's just wild to see kind of how how quickly things can really just roll. And if you're not paing attention, oh, boy, you're going to be in some trouble. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, I'm always interested I'm a big nightly news guy. I think David Muir is awesome, notwithstanding some of the political dialogue that they have on their show, but how long a topic sticks around? Are they going to talk about it today and tomorrow? And then now they got this to move into, and so the other is forgotten, or is it going to just go on and on and on? And you can always tell when it's a slow news day, because typically then they're talking about the weather, but it is interesting the speed at which topics can change. Yeah, or the Friday news dump, always a favorite, the Friday news dump. Yep. <laughs> well, what's your take on influencer marketing? Because it's become incredibly powerful. Yeah, influencer marketing is really pretty interesting to me. And just there's so much variation in different types of influencers, whether you have, you know, you have your celebrities, you have your celebrity influencers, those who are influence who are celebrities because they're influencers, all the way down to like your more micro influencers. It's really interesting to see how different brands can look for the right partnerships and try to leverage these things. And then even see how, if you're finding the right influencers, that can really help you build a lot of trust. Now, on the flip side, sometimes I think that some of those larger influencers may run the risk of kind of becoming too big and losing out on that connection. Like, I think that those especially the micro influencers, that's a great place to where you can have those relationships. And so you can have kind of those connections with people that you maybe interact with somewhat regularly, maybe on social media, if you're a brand or a more public figure and kind of see how that has all changed. I think there's a lot of utility. I think that influencers just kind of want to make sure that they're not, I hate the phrase, stay in your lane, but that's kind of what it is. Like figure out what it is that makes you really good and really likable. And yes, you can grow, but don't let yourself get too big or you're going to start to lose out on some of that authenticity, some of that trust. I think of influencers that it's very clear that early on they might have been really, really genuine, but kind of over time, it's pretty clear that, oh, they're just doing this to become a celebrity. And it's not really necessarily as genuine with you know, everything they're talking about and things that they're endorsing and, and all that. And I mean, influencers really aren't all that new. It's just kind of a different take on celebrity, a different shift towards celebrity. We are really getting to Andy Warhol, everyone's famous for 15 minutes kind of thing. And so I'm like, it's really just a different version of celebrity more than anything. That's a great perspective on that because you're absolutely right. And of course, social media gives anybody the opportunity to become that exactly. But that authenticity is so important. And you mentioned it earlier in our discussion, but that kind of goes across all marketing, really. That authenticity, how you tell your story, 
you know, what your story is and then living that and acting that way is very important. Absolutely. And if you start to kind of lose that, that's when you're going to lose your customers. They're not going to see you the same way. And so all that work you put in to build the relationships and build the trust, it's going to end up going out the window. And really that can be pretty detrimental to you as a brand long-term. If you're kind of, I hate to say forgetting your roots, but if you're really forgetting what got you to where you are, I see that as being pretty problematic in the long run. So it's it's important to really remember as our company's core, who are we and what is that we're trying to do? You know, as a marketing person, what else are you seeing out there that you think is pretty cool from a marketing perspective? I'm really excited about all the changes coming with the NCAA, the name, image, likeness, and how some of those regulations have changed. I think we're going to see a lot of learning experiences and growth. I think on both sides, both the student athletes and the different brands, trying to find a kind of balance between that authenticity of, hey, is this actually a brand that I genuinely like? Are these products I genuinely like? Or is this maybe one that I'm like, I'm here for the money and it is what it is. I don't begrudge anyone for, if you're able to get that deal, go right ahead. Good for you. As long as you can wake up and look at yourself in the mirror in the morning, that I think is what matters, especially for student athletes who are a little bit younger and still kind of learning and figuring things out. I mean, social media has been around long enough now that I hate to say, I'm like, the kids were born into it, but they kind of were. Facebook started when I was my freshman year of college, so that'll tell you how old I am. And it's kind of funny to see so much growth in it. There's been so much change in how people use it and the different individuals that you can connect with and and how you're able to have those networks grow, I think is really pretty fascinating. I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting things with AI in the next few years, but I don't think that it's necessarily all bad because I don't think AI is quite where people seem to think it is. Like it is very easy to tell when a social media post is written by AI. There is a pretty, I don't want to say a standard template, but it's very much, you know, it when you see it, you're like, oh yeah, that was not from a human. That was definitely not a human. It's kind of funny to see. I mean, I have an assignment where my students actually are making Instagram posts from the perspective of, of a brand. And some of them do a really phenomenal job. Every once in a while, I get one or two that I'm like, okay, we're going to redo that one because that was not as creative as I would have liked. So maybe a little bit more more individuality than some of that AI is going to actually provide. So I think there's a lot of great things that can come from it. I think it'll make our jobs a lot easier in certain respects, but I also think that it doesn't get you all the way there. I agree with that. I think it can get you like 85% of the way there but you still have to have that human who can do the critical thinking and look at it and go, oh no, that image, that person has seven fingers on their right hand. It's not all the way there. We've seen tons of improvements, tons of growth just even over the last two years, but at the same time, there's still things that AI just does not do all that well. It's fascinating to see. I agree. And it's going to be fascinating to watch as it continues to evolve. You know, I think going back to authenticity, I think that's one of the things that AI has not, you know, machine learning has not figured that out yet. The tone of the brand, the nuances of the brand or the industry or the marketplace, it's a great tool. It's going to be exciting to see how it develops. And especially for people in the marketing world, it really is a good tool. In fact, a couple of our people from the agency are going to uh, conference, Macon, in Cleveland, which is an AI conference. And, you know, we're all excited here at the agency to see what kind of great ideas and insight they bring back. We've talked about a lot of different things. I think there's some things that I wanted to talk about that maybe we're not going to have time, but I was interested. You've done a lot of writing. You had some really interesting dissertations that you did. And one of them that stood out to me was one that you called, It's All About Me. Yes. What's the idea behind that theory? So that pulls from the idea that consumers use brands on social media as basically signaling devices. And they use associations that they have with brands or maybe brands they talk about to kind of tell their own personal story. So I think a really good example of this are people who are diehard Swifties, so diehard Taylor Swift fans. I can't tell you how many of them I see, and I'm very much a Taylor Swift fan. You can see, I mean, people will have literally in their like display name on X, 
talking about what era's shows they went to. It'll be like Lisbon night one or whatever it was that they went to, or like London night two. It acts as a signaling device. And so it really became this idea of how can you maybe leverage this engagement online with consumers? And I just kind of thought it was really interesting to see how different brands talk to people. And I've been on social media for far too many years. I'm like, it's every time I get my, hey, it's your whatever anniversary on Twitter. It's like, oh God, I've really been on this site for this long. Oh boy. But it's been interesting to see how brands have been much more open to interacting with consumers kind of over time. But I think that, you know, not every brand really should be interacting in the same fashion. And that was actually what the research showed. You know, those brands that are kind of what you would almost think of and see as kind of special. So, you know, it might be the higher end brand. It kind of takes away from some of that cachet that the brand might have. So a brand like Gucci should not be replying to someone like me. I'm, you know, average Joe Schmo on the street. I'm not the person they should be responding to. Now, if Jay-Z is talking to them, yeah, that's a different story. Like that's a very, very different kind of situation, but that's really what it kind of looks at. And those higher end brands really need to be a little bit more selective about who they are kind of encouraging to be interacting with them. I think some brands like a brand like Michael Kors has lost a lot of their value and a lot of how they're seen as being a higher end brand because they have really flooded the market with a lot of their products at lots of different price points. And I think that's actually been detrimental to them in the long run because they've lost out on, hey, we're special. Hey, if you have this product, you are special. I'm like, I can go to you know Marshalls or whatever and go get a Michael Kors bag without a whole lot of effort and it doesn't cost that much. That's a great analogy and a great example because there have been a lot of brands that, you know, in my mind have just sold out and they end up in the discount stores and they're not special anymore. And they lose those people that are looking for the prestige, particularly apparel in this case. And it's unfortunate. I don't know whether it's the money is so powerful, you know, the potential is so powerful, or maybe they started to lose their luster in some other way and they looked to maintain their sales by going that route. By trying to flood the zone with product. And I think that's a really great point on it. it yeah, definitely. You know, it starts out where, oh, you know, hey, maybe we're, we're losing a little bit in sales, but it's like, okay, well, are you willing to, you know, kind of cannibalize those higher end products in exchange for selling this many more of this item that maybe is not the same quality? And I think that's not, I think that's something that brands really do need to watch out for. And that's kind of that idea on social media is if you are engaging with everyone, then it starts to lose out on being quite so special. And so I think it's important for brands to kind of balance the two, still make it exciting when, hey, that brand responds, but also maybe you don't need to be kind of, you still want to make sure you're engaged, but you don't have to engage with just about everyone. But it is still fun to get different brands to actually respond, especially if you're, you know, running into a problem. But yeah, at the same time, it's like, sometimes you're just like, yeah, I just need to talk about this. Just get it off my chest and then I feel better. <laughs> Well, well, I've really enjoyed visiting today, Shannon. We've gone over a lot. You have had a lot of insight to share with our audience. Moving to the Midwest from California, I certainly want to get your insight before we close on living and working in rural America. You know, it's the focus of our podcast. One of the things we try to do is educate people about the people of rural America. When I say those words, what do they mean to you? If you really do think about, you know, rural America versus urban America, we're really not that different. I mean, my in-laws, my husband is from a very teeny tiny town in central Arkansas, grew up on a farm. You drive 30 minutes and then you hit a stoplight kind of a thing. His county had significantly more cattle than people growing up kind of a place. And so it's been really interesting to see there are so many experiences that we have that we all want the same thing. I want my family to be healthy and happy. I want your family to be healthy and happy. And and that's what it comes down to is, you know, those are the things that we all care about. And so having grown up on the West Coast, having been here you know, the better part of two decades, it's been really, really neat to see how similar we all really are. I think the biggest difference is just cost of living, frankly. I fully admit that I still like to 
taunt my dad with our gas prices because he's still in Southern California. I'm at the gas station. I just snap a quick pic of what I paid for a gallon of gas. And a middle finger emoji is not uncommon for me to get in response. <laughs> <laughs> but realistically, like, there's so many things that are, are wonderful in both places that it's just a matter of degrees and figuring out, you know, what are those things that, you know, are going to give you the life that you want to live. And so for me, and, and I mentioned earlier my trade-off, I'm like, Southern California, it's great. I can get to a Trader Joe's in 10 minutes. Here, I have to drive an hour, but my cost of living is way lower. So it's kind of that, oh, all right, I can handle the difference. It is nice to be able to still get, you know, access everything I need. And, and Kansas City, especially with the new airport and kind of everything that they've redeveloped has been just phenomenal to see and be able to access. If I want to go overseas, I can. It's not that hard to fly international out of KCI or it's not that hard to at least get me to places that will go you know, direct from there. It's just nice to see that we're a lot more the same than I think people realize. And I just wish that, I wish people would talk more and realize that. Like we all just want the same thing and everybody to be happy and healthy. And that seems pretty reasonable to me. I agree. I agree. And when it comes right down to it, you know, we all choose the lifestyle that appeals to us, right? What are our priorities? Absolutely. Part of the reason that I, I really enjoy being in Warrensburg, I value a short commute. I used to have to drive 40 minutes each way to swim practice once or twice a day, depending where I was in the season. And it's a lot of time in the car. Now it's, if I hit the red lights, it takes me 10 minutes to get to work. So I'm like, okay, I can handle that. I think I can handle it. <laughs> well, Shannon, thanks for being with us today. Anything else? Words of influence, interest, uh, inspiration for our audience? Well, my biggest thing, hey, if you're ever interested in coming to UCM, we're always happy to have people come take a visit. I'm always happy to host people on campus. Love getting to see prospective students. I think that UCM is very much a hidden gem that people don't realize the experience that they'll get here. I went to huge schools and I loved them, but honestly, like this has been such a great experience here over the past 10 years or eight years. It's really been pretty wonderful to kind of experience that people are wonderful. Our students are absolutely at the heart of everything that we do. And, and that's really what is most important for us. And so we really, I wish more people kind of knew about us, but at the same time, if too many people did, it might not be the same experience. So it's, it is kind of nice to be that hidden gem that we have here. Absolutely. Great pitch for the university. If somebody's interested in getting hold of you directly, what's the best way to communicate with you? I would say send me an email at S. McCarthy at ucmo.edu. Perfect. Shannon, thanks for being with us today. Hey, anytime, anytime. It's great to be here. Great to chat with you. Same here. Folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. If you've liked our visit today, please give us a nice rating and review. And hope you've enjoyed our visit with Shannon McCarthy, Associate Professor at the University of Central Missouri, also the Department Chair for the Department of Marketing, Public Relations, and sports management. Come back again next week and I'll take you down the roads of rural America where it's heaven on earth. Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis. And each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callus offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecallus.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. 